Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Representative Rick Larson's live telephone town hall on COVID-19 vaccines and pandemic relief. My name is Joe Tatino, and I will be moderating this afternoon's call. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us, and uh, we hope you find this call informative. Representative Larson will be taking as many questions from constituents as he possibly can tonight. If you have a question, you can press star three on your phone keypad at any time and you'll be placed in line to speak with a member of our staff. Staff will take down your name, where you are from, and a brief summary of your question. The next time you hear your name, you'll be live on the call and you will be able to ask your question directly. If you are streaming the event on larson.house.gov live or on Facebook, welcome. Uh, you can simply type your name and question below the streaming player. And as you can imagine, we're, we're gonna get a lot of questions tonight, uh, this afternoon. So if you are not able to address your question, please leave a voicemail after the event. Uh, you can send an email to rick.larson at mail.house.gov or call our district office at 425-252-3188. Again, if you have any questions throughout the town hall, please press star three on your keypad or type them below the streaming player. You can also press star six at any time to sign up for Representative Larson's e-newsletter. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Representative Larson. Uh, good afternoon and thanks, Joe. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, today. Uh, here's how this telephone town hall will play out. I'm going to start with a brief update on the federal government's pandemic response and then introduce uh, two guests, Washington State Secretary of Health, Dr. Um, Umer Shaw and Acting Assistant Secretary of Health, Secretary Michelle Roberts, one of the state's leaders on the vaccine rollout. We'll then uh, turn to questions and comments for the next uh, hour or so, a little less than an hour, but as Joe mentioned, if you have any questions, please press star three on your keypad or type them below uh, the streaming player. I'll get to as many questions as, as I can in the time we have. So that's the housekeeping. Let's talk about pandemic relief. I think there's a recognition certainly that uh, although recovery is coming, uh, Washingtonians are still struggling with economic and the public health impacts of COVID-19. And I have said it before, there aren't any shortcuts. The public health response must lead the economic recovery. And last month, President Biden signed into law the American Rescue Plan. This is a comprehensive relief package that I supported to get more shots in arms, money in pockets, kids in schools, and Washingtonians back to work. So let's uh, briefly talk about each of those. The issue I hear most from constituents is vaccines. When can I get a shot? When is it my turn? Well, thanks to the American Rescue Plan and other executive actions that the president has taken and the hard work of Washington State's health professionals and volunteers, more vaccine shots are getting into arms. As of this week, more than 3.3 million vaccine doses have been administered across Washington State, including more than 515,000 in the five counties that uh, are in the second congressional district. And yesterday, you may have heard that Governor Inslee announced that Washingtonians 16 years or older will be eligible for the vaccine starting April 15th, or two weeks from today. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that later from our two experts. The second issue is money in pockets. The American Rescue Plan included economic impact payments of up to $1,400, and those are hitting bank accounts to, right now to help Washingtonians pay some household expenses. Roughly 20% of ARP funding, uh, um, uh, sorry, roughly uh, EIPs made up of 20, made up 20% of ARP funding. 80% of all adults and 77% of all children in Washington state are eligible, including mixed status families and adult dependents. Now, the IRS announced this week that Social Security recipients and other federal beneficiaries who do not normally file a tax return should receive EIPs, or as some people commonly call them, the stimulus checks, by next week. And you can go to irs.gov and click on the Check My Payment tool to find out um, when, and wh uh, when you may be receiving your, um, your uh, stimulus check. Uh, I want to talk about kids in schools and Washingtonians back to work. This week, I visited schools in Arlington, my hometown, 
uh, Cedra Woolley, and just today, Stanwood. And they are, have been using pandemic relief funding to safely return students, teachers, and staff to some in-person learning. And the, um, Amer the American Rescue Plan uh, included nearly $145 million to help schools in the 2nd Congressional District safely reopen. Uh, I also met with small business owners in Everett, Mount Vernon, and Bellingham who uh, told me how the Federal Paycheck Protection Program loans are helping them keep Washingtonians uh, at work, doing the, um, uh, doing the business that's going to help our recovery. But there are next steps we need to take, and there's still a long way to go until full recovery is in place. And I believe the next step that we should take is a bold FDR-like investment in our nation's infrastructure and transportation network to create jobs, to drive economic recovery, ensure the safety of the traveling public, and to fight climate change. And yesterday, President Biden announced his American Jobs Plan, which includes aggressive and progressive investments in transportation over the next eight years. My local transportation priorities for any long-term package does include investing in low and no emission transit, including electric buses. And I was with Mayor Franklin in the city of Everett uh, in the last couple of days on their new electric bus, and they are looking to expand their electric uh, transit fleet here in Everett. Uh, my priorities include as well improving access to science, technology, engineering, and math-based apprenticeships and for uh, career technical education programs that can help diversify and to grow the transportation workforce. We need to replace and repair aging bridges uh, to ensure the safety of the traveling public. And as the chair of the aviation subcommittee, there are a variety of things that we can do to green up aviation travel, including an investment in sustainable aviation fuels and to green, uh, to green up airport operations. So that, that's just a, a slice of the a few things that we need to take care of when it comes to the transportation priorities. I have additional priorities, um, and that document is uh, on my website. You can visit and download that to look at other priorities that I have for transportation investment. But the federal government has a continued role to play in responding to the crisis and to drive economic recovery. And I'll continue to work to ensure these programs help our neighbors to deal with the health and economic consequences of COVID-19. And on that, I know many of you have concerns and questions about the COVID-19 virus, as well as the ongoing uh, public health response here in our state. So for that reason, um, I've asked our Washington Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Umer Shah, to join us tonight. And I'm going to ask him to give us an update uh, and then we'll turn to our other guest, the Acting Assistant Secretary of Health, Michelle Roberts, as well, and talk a little bit more about that. But Secretary Shaw, thanks for joining us tonight. And I want to turn the floor to you for a few minutes to give us an update on the recent news uh, about vaccines and uh, where we are in responding to the pandemic in our state. Dr. Shaw, or Dr. Shaw, or Secretary Shaw? I guess Dr. Secretary Shaw. <laughs> Congressman, thank you. Uh, thank you for those uh, kind, kind uh, uh, remarks and for uh, your continued support and leadership. And I just want to thank you for everything you've been doing over the years uh, uh, to support health and well-being and infrastructure, uh, aviation and beyond. And so I just want to say uh, really appreciate that. Um, and yes, I am, um, to my knowledge, the first Secretary of Health in the state of Washington who is a physician as well. So uh, you're right on both accounts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, um, I, I do want to just maybe give a, a couple of quick uh, background about me just so people know who I am um, because I am relatively new to the state of Washington. Um, I um, am coming from Texas, from, from the Houston area where I was at the local uh, uh, public health agency uh, uh, and was the director there and the local health authority for uh, actually seven years, and I've, I've been in local public health for uh, going on 18 years uh, before I came to the state level. Uh, going from Texas to Washington, it's a big change. It's a big transformation for my entire family, and, and certainly doing that in the midst of a pandemic is, is no small feat. Uh, but I'm, 
really appreciative of the fact that Governor Inslee in December uh, asked me to be the next Secretary of Health uh, at the state of Washington or for the state of Washington. And I'm also uh, very mindful, as uh, Congressman, you just mentioned, of the importance of vaccines and what a lot of uh, the folks on this call right now are very interested in talking about. So that's enough of my background, and I am uh, joined by Assistant Secretary uh, Michelle Roberts, and she is our vaccine guru, as you just mentioned, Congressman, and she's going to answer as many questions alongside me as we can related to both COVID-19 as well as the vaccine. So let me, let me give a quick uh, bird's eye view of where things are. As everybody knows, um, Washington has been a leader uh, across the country when it comes to responding to the pandemic. And in fact, if you look at the, the measures, uh, we uh, generally rank in the top when it comes to any of the measures uh, related to the COVID-19 response. And that includes um, the case rates um, and, and hospitalizations. In fact, we have one of the lowest uh, of the case rates in the country, uh, 50th being the best, and we're 48. So in this case, uh, very, very uh, much uh, close to the bottom is actually really good uh, because we um, have just done such a fantastic job, not the state itself, but the entirety of the state, meaning state, uh, local partners, and community members. And I want to thank all of you uh, who are in Congressman Larson's district to just say thank you for everything you've been doing throughout this very difficult year plus. Uh, we've had three waves, as you know, in the spring last year and then in the summer, um, and then right around the holidays, a third wave, uh, what we call the surge. Uh, these three surges, um, the first two, uh, we really had only the tools of, of being able to shut things down and ask people to wear masks and do all sorts of other things, which has been very challenging for everybody. But now, on this third wave, we have another piece of a tool for us, which is the promise of vaccines, which is what makes this uh, way very different than the previous um, two. However, we came, we were coming down very nicely off of this mountaintop, if you will, of, of surge of activity in cases and hospitalization in the, in the winter um, months and, and obviously post holidays. And we've now, as we hit March, we've started to see a decline and a plateau and a flattening of that decrease. And in fact, in some counties across uh, Washington and across the country, we're starting to see this creeping up of an uptick. And the concern that all of us in the public health community have is this the beginning of a fourth wave. And so I do want to make sure that everybody knows that while the promise of vaccines is absolutely critical, and we're doing everything we can to get as many Washingtonians vaccinated as quickly as possible, as equitably as possible, no matter where you live or who you are. We also wanna recognize that we are not out of this pandemic by any stretch of the imagination. And so we wanna ask you to continue to hold on and do everything you can to help us as we move through this um, difficult time. But we have made a tremendous amount of progress as Congressman Larson just mentioned with 1.3 million people that have been fully vaccinated in the state of Washington, and we've delivered over 3.3 million doses of vaccines. And, and Congressman, if it's okay for me to say this, when I first started in Jan January 3rd, of all the uh, percentage of, of doses that were coming into the state of Washington, 29% were getting into the arms of Washingtonians, and we're now well into the 80s. We uh, set a goal of, at that time, it didn't seem like we would get there, the goal was uh, 45,000 vaccines a day, and this was a couple months back, and we were only at about 13,000 vaccines a day, and we are now at 56,000 vaccine doses a day uh, over the last week, uh, last seven-day average, which means we have now exceeded our 45,000 vaccine goal. So the final thing I wanted to say, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle then because she's got some additional comments about where we are with the different stages and phases, but we have been doing everything we can to prioritize those populations that we thought were most at risk, and this includes health workers and those in long-term care facilities and certainly seniors above the age of 65, although 
Just yesterday, uh, we opened it up to oh, those age 60 to 64 as well. And those in certain occupations and congregate settings uh, that, that would be at risk. And we've done that for about four months. And now, as Congressman Larson mentioned, on April 15th, everyone 16 and older will be eligible for COVID vaccine in the state of Washington. And that is fantastic news. So we're focused not just on the last four months, but we're also focused on the next four months. We want to really make sure we do everything we can to get vaccines into the arms of our community members. The final thing I would say is that there are three, what I call three-legged stool, three pieces of that stool. One is vaccine supply, one is vaccine logistics and administration, and the third leg is vaccine demand. Vaccine supply has been our constraint our limitation over the last several months. That has, it continues to be a challenge for us, but as Congressman mentioned, we're seeing increased doses of vaccines uh, coming or being promised and also coming in the road ahead from the federal government, which is fantastic news as well. But we're also continuing to have our attention focused on logistics and administration of the vaccine, make sure we have the, the support to our local partners so that they can administer and set up those clinics that are really the way to get shots in arms. But finally, there is vaccine demand. And this is something that I do want to just make sure that I touch on with all of you, which is regardless of, of, of you know, who you are, or where you live in the state of Washington, as long as you're above the age of 16, starting April 15th, our message is if, if you're offered, you're able to get an appointment, which it's been challenging because of the vaccine supply limitation, we will ask you to follow this mantra. Don't hesitate, vaccinate. Get the vaccine. There are three vaccines. They're safe, they're effective. Two are two-dose vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, and one is a one-dose vaccine for Johnson & Johnson. Those three vaccines are extremely safe. They're extremely effective. They are safe and effective. And so what I would ask all of you to do is if you um, are able to get an appointment, if you are eligible, if you are able to get an appointment, do not wait for a perfect scenario of a vaccine, this one or that one. The best vaccine is the one that's offered to you. So any of those three work, any of those three are safe, get the vaccine. We wanna make sure we protect you. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you to, to all of you for everything you've been doing. Again, continue to, to do all the things to prevent a transmission and infections in our communities and certainly don't hesitate, vaccinate. That is the key message for us. Congressman, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Assistant Secretary, Ro Assistant Secretary Roberts, uh, you have the floor, go ahead. Great, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, my name is Michelle Roberts and I lead our prevention and community health division at the Department of Health. And that includes a lot of our community health programs, including our immunization program. So really happy to be here and answer questions and talk about who's eligible and some of the great things that are happening. Um, Dr. Shaw already mentioned that we've made some incredible progress and now more than 3.3 million doses of COVID vaccine have been given out in Washington. And across the state, we've administered nearly 83% of the 4 million doses delivered to our providers, healthcare providers across the state. Um, we have work to do still. So um, those 3 million doses are getting us on the way to vaccinate the entire um, population who's eligible in our state. Um, that obviously everybody will be, the broader group will become eligible starting um, April 15th, but that's about 6.3 million people, and many of those will require two doses of vaccine. So we still have a road ahead of us. About 17% of our state population has had um, a full, complete series of vaccines. So we just def we definitely have a road ahead, but really excited about the progress we've made. Um, just yesterday, we opened up to a, the next group of people who are eligible in the state. So right now, we're in kind of um, phase 1B, tiers 3 and 4 of our vaccine distribution. And this includes right now the group of people who became eligible for vaccination yesterday include people 16 years or older who have two or more underlying conditions, anybody age 60 and older, 
people, staff, and volunteers in certain congregate settings, like correctional facilities, group homes for people with disabilities, settings where people are experiencing homelessness, um, high-risk critical workers in certain settings, like agricultural, fishing vessels, food processing, grocery stores, corrections, um, courts, public transit, first responders, restaurant, food service, construction, and manufacturing. And we know that's not our group of all essential workers, but those are the groups where there's been the highest risk and where there has been um, disease transmission happening. So while we had limited vaccine, we really wanted to pick the highest risk settings to protect those workers first. Also people who are eligible right now are people 16 and older who are pregnant or have a disability that puts them at higher risk. Um, people 50 and older who live in a multi-generational household all healthcare workers still are eligible. Our educators and staff and childcare workers are all eligible and people who live or work in long-term care facilities. So that group of people in our Washington, um, in Washington all together is about 5 million people. And like I said, the whole group eligible is gonna be about 6.3 million people. And that final group of eligibility um, we announced yesterday um, as Representative Larson said, it will be starting April 15th, and that will be any remaining people age 16 and older. So really excited to be able to bring this prevention strategy to um, everybody in our state who wants to make a decision to be vaccinated. We have lots of information on our website if you need more information or have questions or concerns about vaccine. And um, just really appreciate everybody's patience while vaccine has been so limited as we've been able to kind of focus on the highest risk people first and continue to expand to broader groups of people in our state. So right. Representative Larson, back to you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Assistant Secretary Roberts. Um, we're gonna, I got, we're gonna go to some questions, but Joe, you have an update? Just a brief update, thank you, sir. Uh, everyone on the phone, uh, feel free to press star three at any time if you have a question or press star six to sign up for Representative Larson's e-newsletter, which is a great way to stay informed. Um, at this time, we want to introduce a survey question. Um, I know some folks have answered online, uh, but where are you calling in from tonight? Uh, if you're calling in from Snohomish County, press 1. Skagit County, press 2. Whatcom County, press 3. Island County, press 4. San Juan County, press 5. Or if you're calling in from somewhere outside the 2nd District, press 6. And we'll let the survey results come through. But uh, with that, Representative Larson, I believe, has a question for Secretary Shaw and Assistant Secretary Roberts. Yeah, I'm going to start with the question, then we'll go to the phones, if you don't mind, folks. Um, it's really for the both of you. We've mentioned that the Governor Inslee announced that uh, if you're 16 years or over, you'll be eligible for vaccines starting Thursday, April 15th, two weeks from today. So, um, uh, not, not to rain on parades, but uh, what are you doing to prepare for the expansion of that eligibility? You know, the supply and demand curve hasn't been meeting on vaccines. How are you preparing uh, for the both the capacity as well as the supply of uh, of uh, to meet the demand that will come with additional people? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Yeah, Congressman. Thank you. Um, you know that that's uh, that's a it's a not just a great question, but it's a very important question. And as Michelle and I described, uh, for the last four months, we've been working through a number of different um, activities related to the three-legged stool of both supply, logistics, and demand. And um, one, of the, one of the key things for us is that we have throughout uh, been noting that our providers have said to us and have indicated and we know this because they've actually uh, asked for it. They, they've requested far more supply than we've been able to, to give them because we don't have enough supply coming in into the state of Washington. And so that, on the one hand, has been great because it also rec uh, recognizes, although it's been challenging, recognizes the fact that they have far more capacity to actually administer vaccine. They've got appointments that, that they would love to to, to you know, make open and book, uh, they just don't have the vaccine supply. So as the supply increases, that's gonna be one really important piece of this. But the second piece of it is that we do recognize that as you start to open up to other 
groups, which includes the groups that Michelle uh, mentioned from yesterday or the groups, as Congressman, you just mentioned, for April 15th, we do recognize that that means that not on April 15th is magically the vaccine unless we have an incredible supply increase, which we do know is not going to happen. It's not that you're going to, to be able to get your vaccine that day. But what we do know, and we've been uh, working through what we're calling behind the scenes of stress testing the system, that we're doing all sorts of things behind the scenes to make sure that we can have the, the system ready to be able to do various things um, on April 15th. And on April 15th or beyond, what that does is it allows people to actually start to really see themselves in a queue, in a line, uh, see themselves in a group, in a prioritization group. And, and before, we couldn't do that. And so that's really a part of what we're doing. And, and we know it's going to take time. And we, we are getting assurances from the president, uh, the administration, the Biden administration, to say that in several weeks, and that's likely going to be in May, that we're going to start to be in a very different place where supply is going to increase significantly. When that happens, Congressman, then we want to be ready, and that's why we've been doing all the stress testing behind the scenes and then obviously doing everything we can to communicate to people. That's great. That's great. Why don't we, uh, Joe, let's go, let's go to the phones now. If, if uh, both the guests are ready for that, we'll go to the phones, and um, we'll start with a question. Joe, go ahead. Yes, we have Carl in Bellingham. Uh, Carl, Carl in Bellingham has a question about Agent Orange exposure and vaccines. Carl, you are now live. Interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason I'm calling is I have a, a friend who is a Vietnam vet exposed to Agent Orange, lives in Bellingham, uh, suffers from dioxin poison in his body, and he wants to know whether it's safe for him to take the COVID vaccines. He tried to get the information out of the VA clinic in Mount Vernon. They gave him no information and weren't really interested in helping him at all. Carl, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Shaw or Secretary Roberts, do you have a question on, uh, do you have an answer on how the vaccine reacts to folks with Agent Orange? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. And, and thank you, Carl, for that question. And I want to thank you, uh, your, your friend service. Uh, I've been a, a VA uh, emergency room physician for 20 plus years uh, in Texas. And so I, I do recognize the incredible, um, just the incredible sacrifice that our veterans have been making and have made for our country and continue to do so. So thank you for that. Um, I don't have a specific answer on the Agent Orange. And I, I, I do think that, um, you know, I will ask Michelle if, you, if you've got uh, some additional information. But what I will say is that the vaccines in general, all three of these vaccines are safe and effective. And unless you have had a prior reaction uh, to and what I mean by reaction is we're, we're talking about severe reaction to uh, the ingredients or components of the vaccines that um, they are safe to, to take, to be able to get those vaccines in your body. So I, I know that doesn't answer specifically the Agent Orange question, but I think it answers the question um, from, a, from a different angle, which is we do not know of any uh, indications that Agent Orange would would be a factor here. And so we can certainly keep looking at that at that question, but uh, not that I'm aware of. And Michelle, I don't know if you have something in addition to that. Yeah, I am not, it, it is not a contraindication, a known contraindication or reason why you shouldn't be vaccinated. So for anybody who has questions, it sounds like your friend did talk with um, the VA, but I would always just encourage back to talking with somebody's healthcare um, provider or maybe making an appointment. But as far as we know, it is, well, it is not a known contraindication. So I would go ahead and get vaccinated and um, or schedule an appointment to talk with a healthcare provider to um, ask more specific details. Yeah, and thanks, Carl. And I'll tell you what, we will um, we'll try to get an answer from my office uh, to you, Carl. If you could leave your contact information with us, um, uh, we'll try to get an answer. Maybe we'll have better luck with the VA. The VA did announce, actually, we did pass the legislation recently. The president signed into law. It went through the House and Senate very quickly. The president signed it that uh, um, uh, all VA healthcare enrollees uh, are eligible for the vaccine. And so uh, 
what we'll do is, um, Carl, if you can leave us some contact info, we will try to get an answer from the VA folks and uh, and get back to you on that. Um, the, the difficulty right, has been no one talks about the ingredients. Yeah, so, so we'll, again, and that's a great point, as uh, Dr. Shaw mentioned, the, com the components, if you've had reactions to the components of the vaccine, uh, you may have reactions to this one. I don't know that, and we'll we'll follow up with the VA. And just to Great. correct what I said, all regardless of your enrollment status, if you are a veteran, period, regardless of whether or not you're enrolled in VA, you are eligible to get a vaccine from the VA. So thanks, Carl. Uh, Joe, next question. Next up, we have Deb. She has a question. Uh, she's eligible for the vaccine, but question about vaccine scheduling. Deb, you are live. I, my, my question is, it requires you to go online and put your social security number in, and I don't have a secure computer. My computer was hacked, and the, uh, my employer already notified us that all of our data has been stolen from there, including social security and all that. So I don't want to put social security out there in one more place. Is there any way to get the, I'm eligible in three different ways. Is there any way to get the vaccine without going online and risking my social security number again? A fair question, uh, Dr. Shaw or uh, Secretary Roberts. Yeah, I can uh, take so this the, one. Thank you. Or, you Oh, okay. Dr. Go ahead. Go Secretary ahead. Roberts, go ahead. Secretary <laughs> Roberts, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say nobody should be asking your Social Security number to take um, to, to 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 get a vaccine. That's actually not a requirement. So, um, if anybody it is, on is your asking, you can. Site. I don't think so, but we can double check because I'll make sure it's not there. So, um, it is a Social Security number is not we we do not routinely collect that, and it's not a requirement. But the also good news is there is we do have phone service um, capacity to be able to help you schedule an appointment as well. So, I'm going to share this number a couple times right now. So it is one eight hundred one eight hundred five two five. 0127. So 1-800-525-0127. And so call that phone number and they can um, provide customer service to help you get um, an appointment scheduled over the phone. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, Deb, just real, it just for you and others, just so you know that we do have, um, obviously um, uh, it's in English, but we also have different languages. Uh, that attend to that phone number. And this is a really important phone number because we also know a lot of our seniors aren't able to go online. And what we've been, um, Governor Inslee and I have been uh, pushing the message over the last two days that if you, not only if you are trying to get a vaccine, but if you have a senior that you're aware of who's having trouble going online or having trouble getting access or trying to figure out how to get access, one, to call the number that uh, that Michelle indicated, but also what we what we want to do is making sure that, that uh, you do everything you can to help the seniors in, in your community to also be able to get vaccinated. So just wanted to share that as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, Joe, I'm going to another question. Next up, we have Tim in Bellingham. Tim has a question about uh, an outbreak at Western Washington University. Tim, you are now live. Thank you very much. Uh, the, at Western, at the University of Washington, Washington State University, all three at least have reported increases in coronavirus cases. Uh, and it does seem that if you look nationally, there's a, a sort of a discontinuity between the younger generations and the reality of what can happen if they don't get vaccinated. Um, I'm not going to assume that we know that they will understand immediately they should get vaccinated, even though they're, they could become eligible. And I'm wondering if there isn't something that can be done that would directly work with the colleges, the community technical colleges, and the universities in our state who have, they have medical facilities to actually get vaccination programs going right there and really directly going to these students and saying it's urgent. That's going to help us economically, too, if they get back in school. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I uh, appreciate uh, your, uh, your question, and uh, good to hear your voice. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Shaw. 
Yeah, let me just say uh, one quick thing, and then I know Michelle's going to have some additional comments here. What, what I, first of all, Tim, thank you so much for, for raising this issue. And I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that there, we've got a, and this has been our strategy throughout, it's a multimodal strategy that we're going in a number of different ways and directions to be able to get vaccines uh, to uh, all populations. <clears throat> no matter who you, <clears throat> excuse me, no matter who you are, where you live, uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're able to get vaccines to you. Now, the challenge, as I mentioned earlier, is that right now we just don't have the supply. So, you know, we are really focusing thus far on the populations that, unfortunately, if they get COVID-19, they're at the highest risk of, of having a, a, a bad outcome, which, which is where my focus has been on seniors, obviously those uh, not just 65 and over, but 60 to 64 plus the 65 and older. So anybody above the age of 60, but in addition, those who are at certain occupations or um, you know, certain risk groups. And that's what we've been doing for the last four months and we'll be doing all the way up through April 15th. Now, it doesn't mean that on April 15th, automatically those populations are not uh, able to continue to get vaccines. They can, but now it opens up to others. Now, this is where your, your comment or question comes in because as it opens up to others, and, and again, this is all predicated on having vaccine supply, then that's where we can start to strategize and work with schools, universities, and other partners, including through our local health departments, to be able to actually do what you're saying. So right now we're not able to. We don't have that that supply, and and we're also focusing on the on the uh, additional populations. But I think you bring up a really good point, Michelle. Did you want to add anything to that? The, uh, just one point I want to add um, is that anybody 16 and older right now who has um, two or more underlying conditions um, that puts you at higher risk for vaccine is eligible and including anybody um, in certain um, professions, which includes child care workers or um, teachers or so. So, so there is some um, students or um, people in that community who will all, who already are eligible for vaccine as well. Yeah, I, I, this is uh, Rick, and I'd be interested in in um, the next steps on that if the state can work with the universities and colleges uh, as as we have seen these outbreaks um, at our universities and um, so if you know if, you, if Dr. Shaw and Secretary Roberts if you can take that idea and run up the flagpole there at, uh, at the governor's office uh, that would be I think helpful it's a helpful idea thanks Tim for calling in thank you uh, I know we, yeah, and Congressman, yep, I did. I, I did want to make one quick comment. This is Dr. Shah. Just a just a reminder that look, we've got you know spring break and we've got you know holidays coming up. We got you know Passover, Easter, Ramadan. Uh, you've got uh, the final four, right? And you know, as you know, I'm from Houston, so I gotta. I, I can't support just the careful, University of Houston, careful. But I gotta support. Careful, Dr. Shah. <laughs> The zags, right? And what we want people to do is to enjoy these kinds of things, but to do it safely. And that is really important because we don't want these events to be super spreader events or events where, especially on college campuses or, or kids who are, who are saying, hey, I want to watch the Zags and I want to watch them win the, the NCAAs. Well, gosh, we don't want you to do it without a mask and doing all those things. And that's a really important message I wanted to make sure to, to highlight. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, just an update. We have about 900 people or so on the call, and thank you all for joining. We're going to keep going with questions. Uh, I would note that the crack about Houston, uh, uh, for those who are actually following the basketball tournament, Gonzaga, of course, in it, and there are three other teams in it, too. One of them is, uh, I think, from Houston, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not tracking any, <laughs> any team but the but Gonzaga Bulldogs, um, for those who are tracking at all, tracking basketball at all uh, tonight. Um uh, Joe, did we have another uh, question or another survey question? Sorry. Yes, we do. We have uh, we have a second survey question tonight, and that the question is: um, How did you hear about tonight's telephone town uh, telephone town hall? You can press one for uh, you received a phone call, two social media, three an email, or four other. It could be from the newspaper or word of mouth. Um, but how did you hear about tonight's telephone town hall? Yeah, thanks. It would be really helpful to us uh, so we can do a better job of 
targeting how we um, promote this uh, the the next telephone town hall in, uh, in the future. So if you can help us out with that, that'd be great. Um, all right, Joe, let's go with the question. Call in question. Yes, we uh, next question is from Karen. Uh, she has a question about economic impact payments. Uh, Karen, you are now live. Karen, are you there? All right, well, Joe, go to the next question, and we'll try to see if we can get Karen back. Sure. Well, well, we'll actually go to Gordon in Everett, who also had a question about economic impact payments. Gordon, you are now live. Hey, how are you? I'm great, Gordon. How are you doing? Right on. Question for Rick, uh, and I appreciate you guys for all you're doing. All right? It's important. Uh, man, I have one specific question, but after hearing everything, I uh, had a ton others. But yeah. I'll, I'll stick to my original question. Okay. I hate this, but because I know the I know the answer. I think. All right. With the stimulus stimulus. Uh, checks that we've all gotten. Yeah. Uh, are we all going to have to pay this back? Uh, th uh, let me try to understand your question, Gordon. Do you mean you've got the the stimulus check, and yep. are you going to have to pay that back? Are we going to ask you for your money back? Eventually. Eventually. As for all. Washingtonians. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, uh, these the economic impact payments were sent out. Um, there you uh, go. The, the six hundred dollars were uh, sent out either exactly. by check or by uh, by debit card at the end of the year or beginning of the year, and then the additional fourteen hundred dollars was sent, and it's continuing to be sent out. That came from the American Rescue Plan, and no, that's the 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 idea is we want money in people's pockets. Uh, yeah. You 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 choose how, what you want to do with it, whether that's go to a, a restaurant that's now open because we're able to move to phase three, or pay down your pay your own bills, utilities, rent, mortgage, help help with the mortgage payment, um, or pay down uh, other bills. Maybe you have a little debt. But the idea was to get money in people's pockets to try to provide some financial relief that was related, uh, that you experienced related to the pandemic. So, the, idea, but in the long term, are we all going to, Americans, are we mm -hmm. all going to have to pay this back? Maybe your broader questions about the um, deficits and debt. Is that uh, okay? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is, and and uh, I think uh, what we need to do is strengthen the U.S. economy that has been hard hit by the pandemic, and continue to show that um, the United States does is willing to stand behind its uh, its death its its debts um, to, go, show that, yeah, to show that yeah to show. To show that we're, you know, we're going to maintain a strong economy. The best thing we can do uh, is to recover from this pandemic, to get to economic recovery and have a strong economy, and that will tell the rest of the world uh, that they can continue to trust the U.S. dollar and the U.S. government and Americans uh, that we'll stand behind ourselves. So, uh, thanks, Gordon, for your question. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll go to the next one, Joe. Yes, next up we have uh, Sabrina has a question about vaccinating uh, 55 and older uh, seniors. Sabrina, you are now live. Hello, hello. Um, uh, hello, everybody. I have to reiterate what the prior caller said. I appreciate this. Um, Rick Larson, I just need to give a shout out to you. You rock, dude. Okay, you do. Oh, thank um, you very much. <laughs> I I see you all the time on MSNBC. I, I just love you. I'm so glad you're my representative. But um, anyway, um, I am about a month out of my second vaccine. I have been vac vaccinated. Um, my physician um, had the foresight 
to actually order vaccines before the rollout actually happened. So um, she literally called me up and says, hey, I got a shot. Do you want it? And I wasted no time getting in there. But I live in a 55-plus mobile home community. And my neighbors, as of right now, have not gotten their vaccines. I have family members who are also in 55-plus communities, be they uh, apartment complexes or mobile home parks such as myself. And I was curious. I know we did some things for nursing homes. And I know there was like, get online if you're 60 and go ahead and register. But is there a plan in place or could there possibly be a plan like um, the suggestion for universities, but actually uh, push the vaccines out to our 55 plus communities? I know I've gotten my flu shot here in my mobile home park every year. Okay. Um, Could we do something of the same thing for our 55 plus communities? Because there are a lot of seniors, my neighbors in particular, (laughs) that are falling through the gap, okay? Yeah, thanks, hey, Sabrina. Thanks for that question. Uh, uh, Secretary Roberts, do you have a, a thought on that? Yeah, we are definitely thinking about strategies like that, especially for any homebound seniors who can't get in. Um, so we're really partnering with our local health jurisdictions who are kind of doing the on-the-ground planning and understanding what their community is, what types of facilities are or group homes may be um, in their community and how do we make sure they are taken care of. So we, our goal over time and as vaccine supply increase is really have everybody have multiple options for where they could be vaccinated. So I love hearing the story that your healthcare provider reached out to you um, when they had vaccine knowing you were eligible. That's one of the ways we definitely wanna see people get vaccinated. We also want to make sure there's vaccine at local pharmacies. So maybe it's just easiest when you're out getting your groceries or maybe there's a workplace clinic for those who are in the workplace. Um, And so everybody could ideally have multiple options, but we definitely are concerned about all our older adults who, um, especially ones who are homebound and may may not be able to leave the house. And we are um, looking to find ways um, and are working to find ways to identify them maybe from, from other service providers and working with local health jurisdictions to get bring, get people out to bring vaccine to to those exact individuals. Yeah, can I? Can okay. I this is Rick Larson. I mean, this is Rick Larson, Sabrina. And, and, and can I put a finer yeah. point on the, on the question, though, uh, Secretary Roberts, uh, Assistant Secretary Roberts? We have there are mobile home uh, parks. There are 55 and over. There are um, independent, you know, senior independent living, um, where you have to have a certain, be a certain age to live there, and so on. But people live independently, but they live in a community independently. And uh, plenty of examples, I can point to plenty of examples in my own district that where Sabrina has has described places in my district. Is there, have you thought about those, because they're not group homes, they're not congregate settings, but it is a cluster of older folks who, you know, one, easy easy to get to, uh, and second, if you're doing, if if some folks are using the flu shot model, um, is there a way to adapt that uh, model for COVID-19 vaccinations? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm talking about with state and local teams. So a lot of independent living facilities in addition to more traditional long-term care or group home facilities. So those are the types of um, communities and, and, and areas that are being identified in every local community and working to um, see about state and local mobile teams going out to, um, to, to vaccinate within those community settings. So it's already happening in our independent living facilities. And um, it's a great suggestion thinking about um, additional 55 and older communities as well, like mobile home communities. So those are what we're working with local government to identify and figure out what our options are for sending out state, either state mobile teams or local mobile teams to offer vaccination. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you. Sabrina. Mm -hmm. Joe. All right, just I want to give everyone a a reminder, press star three on your keypad uh, to get in line to ask a question. I know we have a lot of questions tonight, and also press star six if you would like to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, But I will go to the next question. Uh, Next question is from Craig in Mount Vernon, has a question about the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses. 
Greg, you are now live. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, this forum. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed many of them. Um, my Great. wife and I have a small business in Skagit County, and um, we've had uh, we deal with Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and they are both not really focused on. Uh, I just called them here last week because I wasn't paying attention that it was available for small businesses up until the 31st is what I heard or saw online. And um, I wanted to know if you had any recommendations for uh, a contact of organizations that focus just on the small businesses, whereas the larger banks that we deal with are more focused on larger businesses. They're not really um, focusing on a smaller business like what we have. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And um, that's uh, uh, an unfortunate story be, uh, for you all, um, and it's important because it's, I've heard it, I've heard it several times uh, about the larger banks generally. Uh, what I'd like you to do, well, actually, could you follow up and call my office uh, directly? Um, and for those who um, want that number, uh, it's probably out there, but it's four two five two five two. Three one eight eight, and we'll get a call back to you. And I have a few ideas um, for you to contact uh, for contacts, including uh, the Small Business Development Center or SBDC, which is housed um, uh, in in Mount Vernon at the um, at the uh, Economic Development Association of Skagit County, um, and start with them for to talk through some options. I, I'm, there are plenty of smaller banks who'd be willing to help, but I'm really, I, you know, I'm reluctant to name any of them only because it's not, I can't, you know, I can't really be directing you towards a particular bank. But uh, the SBDC, which is partly funded through tax dollars, uh, they can help you uh, uh, discern what would be the best fit for you, and then perhaps get you in touch with uh, with uh, an appropriate size financial institution, whether that's a local bank or a local credit union. But 425-252-3188. You can even call tonight. We'll pick up the call tomorrow and, and get back to you tomorrow. In fact, the person who's going to call you back is sitting in the room with me. Um, so she's, she already knows. So. Uh, one right. quick follow-up question. And this yeah. is, um, I know so many people that are vaccine reluctant. And... I've seen commercials on television um, that are trying to help people, but uh, I think we could do a better job on helping people that are, and I'm a little frustrated on the, and ignorance means lack of knowledge. I mean, if somebody wants to talk about rocket science, I'm ignorant there, but um, <laughs> basic science of vaccines, how many people don't have vaccines in their bodies already for smallpox and tuberculosis and lots of other issues. And it's mandatory for children to be admitted into public schools, the vast majority of them. So I don't know. I just think we could do a better job because there is, um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there and there's a lot of reluctance. And ignorance is an enemy to public health and welfare. And I think we should really, as a community and as a state, focus more on that. And I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Hey, hey, Craig, th thanks so much. Uh, ignorance is not bliss in, in this uh, circumstance when you have a pandemic. And I uh, appreciate that comment because it's a great follow-up to maybe put this on Dr. Shaw about the public, um, um, uh, the public promotion of vaccines, what you're telling people about them who are reluctant to get vaccinated. Dr. Shaw? Yeah, no, thank. Uh, you know, he was speaking my my language there. I, that uh, music to my ears because that's really what we we're you know saying earlier when I talked about supply and logistics and demand. It's really demand is this concept of you know everything from hesitancy to confidence to um, misunderstanding, misinformation, myths, uh, wrong information, all that stuff that goes in with it, but. What I would really say is that we're, we're doing a lot of things in this regard, but one of the two things that I would just say that, that, are, that are key. One is 
that we all have a responsibility. So as you just mentioned the and asked the question about, you know, uh, the, the misinformation that's out there. Well, you are such an incredibly powerful person in your community to be able to say to someone that is your neighbor or your community member or a family member or somebody who's a colleague at work and say, hey, look, I got the vaccine and here's why I got the vaccine. And when you hear the myths, you can also help dispel them. The other is just the, the concept of, of all the other leaders. And Congressman Larson, absolutely in this regard, Governor Inslee, all sorts of other leaders across in the political world, but there are so many other leaders, faith leaders, leaders who are, you know, uh, constantly trying to get messages out to their community members, business leaders, people who are getting vaccinated for their own, you know, for their own workforce, making sure their workforce is strong, et cetera, et cetera. And go down that there is another group that also includes healthcare providers, and that includes doctors like me, but your PCP, your healthcare provider who is a nurse or who's a dentist or who's, you know, in a, 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 a acupuncture or a therapist, uh, just go down the list. All of us need to be very much mindful of how do we get the right information out to people, but also, and Congressman, this is the key, also be willing to share it with others. Don't just get your vaccine and say, don't tell it. Get your vaccine. Be proud of it. Tell people about it. And, and also do your best to try to help us with that, that information. And then the final thing that I would say is that, yes, we are absolutely looking at ads and all the other things that we need to do. But I think it always works most, the people that you trust, because those are the people you Yeah, great. But, you know, it's, it's a little after 530. We're going to go to about 540. Um, so probably have time for two more questions. I would note that uh, I have been vaccinated, and uh, you know, my joke is that I, ha yes, there are side effects to being vaccinated. And I had my first, my first shot. I had, uh, I had the chills and the headache, and the achy bones, and it was gone 24 hours later, like like it never happened. Um, my second vaccine, um, which is supposed to be worse, I I got my second vaccination shot on January 6th also known as Insurrection Day on Capitol Hill. And so the side effect was uh, an insurrection. That's, so no one's going to have a worse second side effect than, than me. So please, people, get vaccinated. My mom complains about it hurt her arm where the shot took place. That was the worst thing my 83-year-old mother had. It's going to be okay. So I really encourage folks, if you're reluctant because of side effects, they will go away, and most people don't get them. Um, and uh, my family is an example of that. So I uh, appreciate it, and I want to go to Joe. Uh, that's a great segue into a question we've gotten online and from a couple of folks on the phone. Uh, could we repeat the phone number to make a vaccine appointment? We've had a, a couple of folks ask for that. Secretary Roberts? Sure, yep, that number is 1-800-525. 0127. 1-800-525-0127. Great. That might have been the easiest question. <laughs> I'm done for the night, night, right? Next one's for exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Uh, up next, we have Catherine. She's a high school teacher. Uh, Catherine, you are now live. Thank you, and a big shout out to CMA here in Bellingham for vaccinating me. I'm a fully vaccinated teacher. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> Great. Yep, yep, and it was pretty easy to do, no line. Anyway, I, I have been without my students for a year. I, I've been online with them entirely this entire time. What I'm concerned about is when we come back that we're going to just try and jump into the content, jump into the tests, and we need to take care of the kids first, like their mental health, the anxiety that they're going through, coming back into a building, you know, that, that's going to be important. So I'm hoping that we can find really how are we going to direct those funds to get health care, actual health care people into our buildings because I love them, I work with them, I support them, but I don't know how to, to help them that way. So that was my first part. 
Second part, really quick, is that um, the students from uh, Governor Inslee were coming back on April 19th in the different hybrid situations. Yeah. The vaccinations are coming in for, the, for April 15th. And so, yes, sophomores, you know, the 16-year-old is usually a sophomore right about now, maybe like uh, even a couple of freshmen. I, I'm just trying to think of, like, how can we help the schools vaccinate the students? Because it, it does take, you know, a couple of weeks between each thing to become fully, fully vaccinated. What are your thoughts? How can either the federal government or the state government help us with those two things? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I am not qualified to answer that question. I want to be really clear about, about that. And so uh, I do want to turn, turn to Dr. Shaw about how he's thinking about it. What we did through the American Rescue Plan is to include uh, $128.5 billion to help schools reopen safely. Washington State has received uh, or has an idea of what its allocation of that amount is going to be. And then the, um, the education department at the state called the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction is currently having a conversation with school districts on those allocations, how much the school districts are going to get. And school districts have a certain amount of freedom to define how they're going to use those dollars to assist with um, schools reopening safely. Uh, that's how that's going to work. Uh, I am not, though, qualified to determine, to, to tell any school board um, what they should do and how they should do it. But they need to clearly do that in consultation as a school board with parents, uh, with teachers, with administrative staff, and, and with, uh, with using the best healthcare guidelines. On that point, I turn to Dr. Shaw to see if he'd like to um, uh, add, anything, add, anything, add anything to the answer. Well, Congressman, uh, for not being an expert, you answered it pretty well, I'll be honest. Um, what, what, I would, what I would just add a couple of things here. One is, as everyone knows on this call, Governor Inslee, a couple of weeks back, uh, called attention of this, of this real, you know, this real crisis that we have um, that is not just about health and the mental health and behavioral health of kids, but also the, the education and the development of children and students that, that are um, unfortunately not in person in school. And we know it's a very difficult and, and a very touchy subject. Uh, look, I, you know, my wife and I, we've got three kids, uh, 11, 7, 4. You know, we're, we're constantly every single day struggling with some challenge in there, you know, in, in, this, in this changed environment for all of us. I think you're right about the fact that we've got to really be thinking about health in a very holistic way. The challenge that we've got right now is that we're still um, in, in this real uh, vaccine air, uh, area where we don't have the supply uh, fully that we need, but that's going to change. And we're running up against the end of the school year. So I think that's the other piece. I think we're going to be in a markedly different place. And Michelle, please chime in on this. Markedly different place uh, when, when, the, when the fall rolls around, when we, we're past, you know, the, the next month or two here of the school year. Obviously, there's summer, but then in the fall, we're going to be in a markedly different place. And remember, the, the Pfizer vaccine now the company has released, and of course, it still needs to go mm-hmm. through FDA and CDC, but the company has also said that, look, uh, we were very effective, this is the company Pfizer saying, of, of being able to vaccinate for 12 to 15-year-olds. And so that also starts to decrease the age where you can do it. And we, we anticipate even in the summer that you will have you know, children even younger than age 12 who are going to be able to get vaccinated. But it's not just about vaccines. It's about a whole human being. A child is not just a, a, a vaccine. A child is about everything. And so we've got to really do a lot of work. And that's been the real hard part about COVID-19, that in trying to do all the things to protect people, there have been impacts of that. And that also means that we're going to have to really, in the words of, of the president, build back better. And, and I think that is something we have to really be thinking about. Michelle, is there anything that you wanted to add on that one? Yeah, I'll just echo the comments that all of us are really concerned about the mental health impacts of the pandemic on all of us. And um, it is a normal 
um, part of the response to any emergency, and definitely this pandemic, it is an emergency to have um, a lot of health um, health impacts for all of us. But they've been especially hard on our on our youth, and so it's an area that I know Governor Inslee is really concerned about, and um, multiple state agencies are as well. So there is some legislative task force that a lot of us um, state agencies are helping to support, really looking. Um, at children and youth um, mental health and what types of additional resources or services do we need to really increase the infrastructure um, to make sure our youth have the support they need um, and that includes in the school setting. So there's no final decisions there but we are looking as our legislative session um, is in progress to think about um, where could we put some additional resources to really help better support youth and think about exactly what you're talking about. How do we um, how do we transition back to some more day-to-day -day activities and do that as effectively um, as we can? And so just thanks for what you're doing. It has been a hard year, um, like Dr. Shaw <laughs> said. Those of us that are parents um, really appreciate everything our teachers, um, te our, our kids' teachers have been doing. And just thanks for how um, thoughtfully it sounds like you're approaching um, the, re um, the return to the school building. Yeah. Excited to do yeah. that. Thank you so much. And also, if you can put in a call for canceling the uh, state testing this year, that would be great too. Thank you so much. Have a great night. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. And I'll just say I want to say thank you to Catherine. I've, I have sisters and sisters in laws and um, nieces that are teachers. And um, uh, so I understand where Catherine's coming from uh, on this um, as well. And uh, I've, as I noted, visited. Uh, two high schools and an elementary school this week and um, they're they're all doing things a little bit differently a lot of it's the same but a little bit differently and so speaking to what any one school district will do it's not necessarily going to mean a different school uh, uh, another school district will do it the same way um, either so there's gonna be some challenges but on that question for parents on the call you know I think really communicating with your school board members with your principals and your superintendents is really a, the key to um, coming to coming to the right conclusion for the districts that you live in. Um, you know, it's 5:40 plus. Uh, I think 5:42 here, and I promised uh, folks we could be done. We could probably go on, and I think we're gonna, probably going to schedule a teletown hall again soon uh, in order to uh, get updated uh, about where things are. But I want to thank my guests tonight and. Just quickly, if you've got anything, final words you want to pass on, uh, uh, Secretary Roberts, you've got anything you want to add? I'll just add that um, thanks for everybody for doing your part. Really, please go get vaccinated um, when it's your turn in line. If you have questions or concerns about vaccine, please talk to um, your healthcare provider so, or look at the information on our website. And in the meantime, it's really important we all keep doing some of the other prevention me measures like wearing our masks and keeping our social distance as we increase the the number of people in our state that are fully vaccinated so we can put this pandemic behind us. Great. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Shaw. You know, I, I, as I mentioned, Congressman, that, um, that Michelle was going to feel the thunder and she just did again. So everything she said, ditto, ditto, ditto. I would just say again that we're in it together and it's so important that until we're out of this pandemic, we're still in it. And let's just not forget that. Uh, we do not want this to bite us again, and it's 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 taken over far too many communities, and and to, to far too many parts of this country. And so let's do everything we can to keep fighting this pandemic, and don't hesitate vaccinate. I think that's the key second message of this. And then finally, when we have all these gatherings, uh, please remember that we're still in the pandemic, and um, go Zags. I guess uh, let me let me. Let me finish with that one, but I do want to thank you, Congressman, and everybody that's been on tonight. Uh, I just want to say thank you. It's uh, it's been a it's been an incredible welcome into the state of Washington, and certainly coming in the middle of the pandemic has been challenging. But but thank you for your leadership and support, and we we do everything we can to keep working on all these issues. This is our number one priority right now. Great, thank you, and uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us as well tonight, and. Uh, as Dr. Shaw said, don't, hes don't hesitate, vaccinate. Um, 
I really appreciate that message. I'd also note, again, uh, the work hasn't ended. Uh, we did pass the American Rescue Plan, but there's still parts of that to be implemented, both with our schools, making sure there are enough vaccines uh, to meet the demand um, out there. Still, folks, as we heard questions with the economic impact payments and small business owners uh, still working the process to um, help them uh, uh, get through the pandemic. So it's still a lot of work done. We're at my office ready, willing, and able um, to assist um, in any way we can. And uh, uh, again, our number here is 425-252-3188. And we're moving uh, as well into economic recovery. And uh, uh, the president rolled out his American Jobs Plan Wednesday or yesterday, and we'll be on my committee, on the Transportation, Transportation Committee, looking at ways to um, support it, as well as to ensure that it uh, fits the needs of the, our district and the state. Uh, we de do need that FDR-like investment in our nation's infrastructure for economic recovery and creating jobs and to um, combat climate change. So we'll be, uh, I'll be focused on that issue as well. So with that, Joe, I'll turn it back over to you uh, to wrap up. Thank you, Representative, and thank you to our, both of our guests. Uh, just one Final reiteration, if we weren't able to get to your question and we had about 60 waiting in the queue, you can leave a voicemail after this event has concluded. Uh, you can send us an email at rick.larson at mail.house.gov, or you can call our office, like the representative said, 425-252-3188. I want to thank everyone again. Uh, have a good rest of your day, and go Zags. Thank you, everyone.